Make sure you get your <clears throat> oh, make sure you get your notes and everything from the back. And uh, wow. <clears throat> if you have your Bibles, open up to Nehemiah chapter one. Nehemiah chapter one. And we are going to begin a new series on the book of Nehemiah. And as you know, we have looked at 2024 with the topic and a, having a word from the Lord with the word build. And um, I have a, in the back where the notes are as well, I have a little bookmark for you. I thought I had it in my Bible. I must have set it to the side. Uh, so, Bill, I think I gave you one. Yeah, let me see that. Yeah, thanks. <clears throat> but this is, uh, when you came in today, hopefully you saw the flags that we had put up on walking in, because I want to keep it ever before us. Uh, last year, we just put them on stands. This year, I wanted to do something a little bit more pronounced, and so we put three flags up with uh, this, um, pretty much looks like this uh, that you see, but it's a bookmark that you can take to keep it before you, remind you, keep it in your Bible, read, uh, but we are looking to build, build ourselves first, then our marriages, then our families, then the church. That's the, for the glory of God. That's the, that's the focus point for the year. And so this word build is something that I really believe and I'm excited about. And thank you guys so much for, A, many of you coming up saying how excited you are. And some even coming up saying, man, that's just what we were feeling as a couple for our own selves. And man, just what the Lord is doing, the same word. I love it. Thank you so much. And so I want to keep it ever before us. So we have this on the front with the scripture and everything. And then on the back, it just says build with the scripture reference uh, it's just a wonderful reminder. Keep it in your Bible. Keep it here for you uh, to remind you this is what we're doing because we always need to be reminded, don't we? It's like, what is this year about? What is this about? Okay, I'll build. And this is what this is for. There'll be other things that I'm going to be putting together for you throughout the year just to remind you. And so in this process of, and, uh, for the year of the word build, I, I thought, you know, there's no better book in the Bible that I think can help us out than the book of Nehemiah. Because Nehemiah, we know uh, what the book is about, but he begins the task to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And the walls and the gates that are torn down and burned, which we'll read about in just a moment, uh, but it's just really about Nehemiah building himself and how he went about the Lord using him to begin this process of really restoring the nation of Israel and in some ways the city of Jerusalem, the city of God and what the Lord was doing. And so we're going to look into that a little bit and we're going to uh, spend today really giving a, a history lesson uh, before we dive into it as to what takes place here in Nehemiah and um, it's going to be a great time. So if you have your Bibles, Nehemiah chapter 1, let's look at it and read it together. It says, the words of Nehemiah from the sons of Hakaliah. Now it happened in the months of Chislev, in the 20th year, as I was in Susa, the citadel, that Haniah, one of my brothers, came from certain men from Judah. When I asked them concerning the Jews who escaped who had survived the exile concerning Jerusalem, they said to me, the remnant there in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are destroyed by fire. As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And I said, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps 
covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant that I now pray before you day and night for the people of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Even I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, the rules that you have commanded your servant Moses. Remember the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there I will gather them and bring them to the place that I have chosen to make my name dwell there. They are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and your strong hand. O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name and give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of men. Now, I was a cupbearer to the king. Let's pray. Father, I thank you, Lord, for Nehemiah and for what this book represents. Lord, this book is not only just about a man, but it is about an ordinary man whom you used to accomplish what you desired for your city to be restored. But Lord, even more than Nehemiah, this book is about you and your faithfulness and your power and your glory. And so, Father, help us today as we walk through this book over the next seven, eight weeks. Help us and give us ears to hear, and then help us not only look at this book and study this book, but then apply it to our lives, because we don't want to be people who just hear the word and not doers of the word. But Lord, we want to be men and women that walk in your name, for your name's sake we pray. And we thank you for it, God, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Before we dive into Nehemiah chapter 1, I did want to give you a little bit of history of how we got to this place and what is transpiring. Most of the time, in the, back when the Bible was put together, you would have Ezra and Nehemiah were joined as one book. It wasn't until later that they, they kind of separated them, made them two distinct books. So you can read Ezra and Nehemiah, and you're basically getting the same thing. There's a couple years difference in between. But what we know from this is that Nehemiah is written during the Persian Empire. And in a moment, I'll give you a map of Persia. Well, let me go ahead and put it on there now, because I want you to see that this was a massive, massive empire. It was probably, um, uh, I, I think we know uh, what had happened. It was larger than, obviously, Babylon. And, it, and it's almost, I think it's just about the size of the Roman Empire. But you can see, I don't know if you can tell the distinctions, but it shows a little bit. I mean, it goes from Egypt, which is over here, this is Egypt right here. So it goes from the edge of Egypt all the way over in here, which you're getting into Iran, Iraq, modern day. This is Turkey kind of up here, all throughout here. Here's Jerusalem and Israel and all this that's taken place. Here's Susa where he's, Nehemiah is, right in that place. And then that's the capital of the Persian Empire, which you'll get into. And so the history of how we got to this point is that the children of Israel began to worship other gods. And so you remember the prophet Jeremiah comes and he prophesies that the people, that God was done with them, that they were an unfaithful people, and that God was going to lead the nation into exile. And so what happens is Babylon comes in and ransacks Jerusalem and Israel, Jerusalem in particular, takes everything out of the temple. The temple is destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. 
We know that Nebuchadnezzar then goes in and he takes really the best and the brightest of the young men and young women, and he brings them to Babylon. Thus, we have Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel. We have those men in the Bible there that describe the Babylonian captivity. Jeremiah has also prophesied that this exile would be 70 years. So he, not only he's letting the people know, Jeremiah speaking for God, God is letting the people know through Jeremiah that this exile that they're going to be in is going to be for 70 years. And so you have the Babylonian empire that comes along. And, and so just like any other you know, um, empires rise and empires fall, kings are risen up, kings are fall. So you have all of these different empires that you have to. That's why when you read the Old Testament, especially the Old Testament prophets, you must understand the situation in which the Old Testament prophets, both the major prophets and the minor prophets, you have to see what time frame are they prophesying. Who was the reigning powers of the day? Because everything that they're writing about has a historical context to it. Just like Jeremiah was prophesying during the time of the Babylonian Empire, just as though Daniel was writing during the Babylonian Empire, Isaiah is writing at a different time. You know, all of the, um, all of, Ezekiel is writing at a different time. Some of the minor prophets that we read, Malachi is speaking during the time of the Persian Empire. He's kind of like a contemporary of Nehemiah during this time. So whenever you read the Old Testament and get into the prophets, you need that background to help you understand the book more clearly. And so we have the Babylonian Empire, which is the power empire at the time, but then God is doing something else. God is raising up another king, and he's raising up another empire. And so who you have at this time is you have who is called Cyrus the Great. He is 1559 to 1530 BC, uh, Cyrus comes in and he conquers the Medes. You had the Medes and the Persians. He conquers the Medes in 15, uh, 549 BC. And then in 539 BC, he conquers Babylon. He comes in and takes over the city of Babylon right here on this map. There's Babylon right here. And so this becomes a central point for the Persian Empire, and then they move the capital then over here between Susa and the other city there. And so you have Cyrus the Great who comes, and he is, uh, God puts on his heart, he's, he's very compassionate from what we can read, a very compassionate king. He uh, is uh, sympathetic to the Jews, so much so You're at Nehemiah chapter 1. Go back about five pages in your Bible to Ezra chapter 1. And you're going to see here what God does through this king, Cyrus. Okay? Ezra chapter 1. So Cyrus the Great comes in. He conquers Babylon. And now he sets up a Persian empire. And then what God does is God then begins to move on Cyrus. Look in Ezra chapter 1. In the first year of Cyrus the king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. In other words, Jeremiah prophesying that the temple's going to be restored, 70 years of captivity is coming to an end. He says that the word of the Lord might be fulfilled. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus the king of Persia so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom, and he also put it in writing. Thus says Cyrus, the king of Persia, The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has charged me to build a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judea. Whoever is among you, all his people, may God, may his God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem which is in Judea, and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. And let each survivor in whatever place he sojourns be assisted by the men of his place with silver and gold, with goods, with beasts, besides freewill offerings for the house of God that is in Jerusalem. And so you can see something significant has happened now. 
God is on the move. God has used Cyrus the, King, the Great to come and conquer Babylon, to set up his kingdom and his reign. And you're talking about this land here. There's a 127, um, 127 different provinces that Cyrus the Great was over. I mean, he was the first ruler of the Persian Empire. He is well... Um, uh, obviously known, and he sets some stuff out. But what he does is one of the first acts that he does is he, uh, after gaining control and defeating Babylon, is he authorizes the Jews to go back to Jerusalem. This is phenomenal, man. I mean, this is like a dream come true. I'm sure the Jews couldn't believe this, but here you have this edict from this king giving them permission to go back. And not only that, he's telling the people to give them gold and silver so that they could go back and build the temple of the Lord. And this is where Ezra, who is the priest during the time of Nehemiah, Nehemiah and Ezra worked together when they rebuilt the wall. And Nehemiah, about chapter six, Ezra comes onto the scene. But Ezra is the one who is leading a spiritual revival for the children of Israel. They see all of the people returning to Jerusalem, plus the ones who were already there during that 70 years of exile that has taken place. Remember, the Babylonian, they didn't just wipe out Jerusalem and kill everybody. What they did is they just took the best and the brightest, took them to Babylon, but the rest of them were just there living life, doing it, knowing that they had been, that the judgment of God was on them. And now all of a sudden, Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon is defeated. Cyrus the king, Cyrus the great, has now come and made this edict to go back. He's been moved on by God. He recognizes that God has given them the kingdom. And now what he's doing, he's saying, I want you to go back and I want you to build the temple. And Ezra begins this spiritual revival that takes place. So in your reading this week, read Ezra, read Nehemiah, read all just Oh, like I said, we're going through this book. I'm never going to be able to give you enough information and the things that you can do. Plus, the Holy Spirit will want to quicken your heart as to what he wants to speak to you on through these books. But Ezra and Nehemiah, read these two books together and begin to journey with me as we walk through this thing to see the mighty hand of God and how when we face obstacles, and we'll get into this in just a little bit, but when we face obstacles, we don't have to worry about who's in charge because we know who's in charge. We, we, we don't have to worry about who's, who's the president of the United States. We know who is the king of kings and the Lord of lords, who has the president of the United States in his hand, just like he did the king of Cyrus, uh, just like he did the king of Persia, Cyrus. Look what he says, man. The spirit, the spirit stirred up the king of Persia, Cyrus, the king of Persia. It wasn't Cyrus having this. This is God moving on his heart saying, hey, this is what I want you to do. And then Cyrus responding to that stirring of the spirit that God does. And so we see all of this that takes place during this time. And so what you have during this time of captivity and this journey back to Jerusalem for some of the people, and that's what the rest of chapter one of Ezra is about. It's about these families, all these different families that God moves on their heart to go back to the land and to begin uh, to rebuilding the altar, rebuilding the temple. And we have all of this that has taken place. And so you have Cyrus the Great during that time, then he dies, then you have uh, other sons. If you go down the Persian line here, Eventually, then you have Darius the first, who is the great, uh, and under his, this is where the rebuilding of Jerusalem's temple begins because there's, there's stop and go, stop and go throughout this time until it is completed. And you can read about that in Ezra chapter 6, verse 15. But all of this happens uh, under Cyrus the king, and then Darius the great is when it really reaches its peak. Uh, they would say that the different things that I've read that there were probably 50 million people living in this region during that time, and 44% of those 50 million people would have been under the rule of the Persian Empire during this time. That's how massive this empire was. And so then um, Darius the Great dies, 
then you have another king who comes in, and then you have Artaxerxes, who is the king during the time of Nehemiah. This is where we get into when we see that Nehemiah comes onto the picture. And this is where we're going to jump into now. So Artaxerxes is here. He is the king during the time of Nehemiah. We'll read about him next week in Nehemiah chapter 2. You can read about it as well. But it's Artaxerxes, and there's about four other guys during the, the reign of the Persian Empire until finally Darius the third in 300 B.C. time frame. So about 200-year reign here of the Persian Empire that's taken place. And it wasn't until about 300, 330 B.C. that Darius the third, who is the great-grandson of Darius the Great, um, he was the last king. And then that's when Darius the third is defeated by Alexander the Great. So if you watch the movie Alexander, uh, he is there, he battles, they come over, take over the rule and reign, and then he begins his reign um, as the king over the empire. So just a little bit of a history lesson here. But now we're here with Nehemiah during the time of the king of Artaxerxes. And so what we see from him is that Nehemiah is there in Nineveh, in Susa, more than likely, Nehemiah was probably born in captivity. So in other words, he's probably never been to Jerusalem. He's probably the product of a, the son of someone who was brought into captivity, into Babylon, and then was born in captivity. So you can imagine what that's like. But he knows his homeland. He knows Jerusalem. He has a longing for it. He has seen and heard what Cyrus the Great has done with the rebuilding of the temple and it being completed. When Nehemiah then comes, as we see in Nehemiah chapter 1 as we dive into this, is that he gets word from his brothers. And so here's the, this and my focus point of this. And um, We see this here. I, I don't have, um, Heather, I don't have, uh, the monitor's not on. I can't see what I've got. I'm, that's why I'm always having to look back. So if I have to look back to see where I'm at, what's on the screen, you'll understand why. So I don't know what's up there. We'll just have to look at that. But my focus point today is simply this. During the times of difficulty, we should turn to prayer and the character of God. During the times of difficulty, we should Turn to prayer and the character of God. Nehemiah's name, if you break it down, Nehemiah's name means Yahweh comforts. And uh, he is the famous uh, cupbearer for the king. And if you know anything about being a cupbearer, you know that that is a very trusted position. Uh, the king trusts no one like he does his cupbearer. Because the cupbearer comes in, and what it does is before the king would ever drink wine, the cupbearer would drink that wine to show that it wasn't poisoned. So he's basically taking on this element to show the king. He's going to pour a glass for himself of wine. He's going to drink it, and then he'll pour the king's wine for him. People, when you're in positions of leadership, especially in those days, they were constantly trying to take you out, assassinate you, do something. And many times the kings were poisoned and um, whether it was family members who wanted to get in there and take over or whatever the case may be. And so the cupbearer really was the most trusted position really in all of the kingdom. I mean, you had the king's trust at that point because you're basically saying, I'm going to die for you. I'm going to die if there's poison in this. If somebody's trying to come and poison you, that is going to be, I'm going to be the one that ends up dying, not you. And so we can see this. And so he's a trusted um, servant of the king, 
but he loves God and he fears God. And I'm sure he's excited about what's happening in Jerusalem with the building of the temple and all that is taking place. Nehemiah is probably written about 400 and, uh, 445 BC so that we know that. And Nehemiah is here and he wants to hear about the conditions of what's happening in the city of Jerusalem. So he's there, he's in Susa, he's there at the citadel there and with the capital, with the king, when a brother comes. Now, speculation is this is a, his real brother. It's not just a brother in the Lord type thing, but he has brothers that come and one of his brothers come and he gets a report. He wants to hear what's happening. He, he loves Jerusalem. He longs for that. That's his city of God's people. He understands all that's taken place and he wants to get a report as to what's happening. And so he says in verse two, he says, and I asked them concerning the Jews who escaped, who had survived the exile and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the remnant there in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. And why are they in great trouble and shame? He tells us, the walls of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are destroyed by fire. The walls of Jerusalem are broken down and its gates are destroyed by fire. Folks, this is like an incredible um, weakness that is on Jerusalem in and of itself. The walls of a city were like paramount for safety and protection. When your walls were uh, when your walls are broken down, when your walls have holes and gaps in them, you become vulnerable to outside influences coming in to steal things, to kill you, to do whatever the case may be. And then when your gates are burned down and you have no protection, they can just come in at any time and you are already living in exile. You've been living in exile. Now you constantly have fear. Who's going to be the next king that's going to try to come in and destroy the temple and destroy my home and, and take me into captivity once again? You're constantly living under that threat. That, and it's just shame on a city. When you read through the book of Proverbs... There's a number of Proverbs in which Solomon writes, and he talks about that the walls of a, of a city, the man who lacks self-control, he says, is a man who's like a city without walls. It's a powerful proverb for us making sure that we don't get into anger, that we have self-control in our life. And Solomon, the wisest man in the world, besides Jesus, obviously, but the wisest man in the world comes in and he says this, he says, an angry man, a man without, uh, a man without self-control is like a city without walls. And so he's letting you know the shame of what your city is like if you don't have walls. You, you don't have any self-control. You're, you're, you don't have any protection. There's, there's nothing special about you. And so that's why Nehemiah, he says, as soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. He, he sits down and weeps for days, for months on end, weeping over this idea of this city without walls and its gates are destroyed by fire. Look at the quote in your notes. Um, uh, must not have this quote, but it's in your notes. You can read it. It says, I thought I put it on the screen, but apparently not. It says, Nehemiah is a visible reminder to the Israelite people of the unchanging mercy of God. Life has changed for them, and some of the treasured institutions were no more, but the Lord was with them, raising up a new people to refine and invigorate the vulnerable community. A trusted wine servant in a pagan palace becomes God's instrument 
for Israel's renewal. That is just an amazing thing for us to consider. This, this pagan um, palace has got a man of God right there, and he's going to be God's instrument of change in what we see. And so I want to look at, when we've already talked about this really, is uh, Nehemiah's news. It's obviously during the reign of Artaxerxes. What has taken place, I've already mentioned this. But then Nehemiah's prayer. This is Nehemiah's prayer. We hear the news, Nehemiah gets the news of what has taken place, and he instantly begins to pray. And I love this, because this is here. This is the first of nine prayers that Nehemiah uses in his book when he's writing. And so the first characteristic of Nehemiah that we see is that he was a man of prayer, but he's also a man of, not only is he a man committed to prayer, but I think he's a man of persistent prayer. Look what he says in verse 6, and he says this, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to the prayer of your servant <clears throat> that I now pray before you day and night for the people of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the people of Israel which have sinned against you. So he's praying for them for days, for really months on end. It's not that Nehemiah kind of like prays for a couple days and then he approaches Artaxerxes about going to Jerusalem. He begins a time of prayer and he's praying and in this prayer he is persistent. So much so that from what we can gather from the book, he prays anywhere from 90 to 150 days before he ever goes to Artaxerxes and asks him to go to Jerusalem. Think of that. I mean, have you ever prayed for something that's going on in your life for 90 to 150 days? Have you been persistent every day as he has day and night asking God? I'm sure he's praying and asking God for wisdom. I'm sure he is being stirred on his heart to know that he's going to go to the king and ask him if he can go to Jerusalem to rebuild the walls. I'm sure that all this is stirring inside of him and he's got to know. He's got to know that, hey man, this it's going to be something that's going to be impossible without God. And so he just doesn't pray for a week. You see, we live in a culture today that is instant gratification. That if I pray and nothing happens in the first 20 minutes or first two days, or maybe let's stretch it out the first two weeks, we just kind of give up on it. We're like, well, it must not be God's will. Well, it must not be this. Well, you know, and we just tend to move on if we're not getting the answer that we're looking for or we're seeing. But where Nehemiah is coming in, he's a man that is committed to prayer. You know he's committed to prayer because the minute he hears that the walls are torn down and the gates are burned, he begins to weep and he begins to pray and he's crying out to God. His prayers are very natural. His prayers are immediate. And man, you can just see how he just very instinctively just turns to God when it's that. He's casting, I think, all of his anxieties on the Lord, just like we should and what the Bible commands us to do. But here's the other thing. Prayer for Nehemiah is his first resort, not his last resort. He doesn't first think, well, man, let, what can I do with my brothers here? And what can we do? What can I do to help out? And maybe I can send some finances or anything like that. Well, maybe I can go to the king and ask him immediately. No, the first thing Nehemiah does is he turns to God and he begins to pray and he begins to ask God what it is that he should do. You see, when we come in and we've started out 2024 with the word build, building our lives, building our marriages, building our families, building the church for the glory of God. When we start out, I want us starting out with prayer. Yesterday when we met with the men and we're going through the balanced life, the first area that we hit was this, our relationship with God. What is your relationship with God like? 
Are you a man and woman of prayer? Are you starting out wanting to build your life, wanting to build your marriage, wanting to build your family, wanting to build your church for the glory of God? We've got to begin in prayer. We've got to ask God, say, Lord, what is it that you want to do in me? And what can I do in my family and my marriage? And what can I do to build the church of Jesus Christ? What is it that you want to build in me? What fruit of the Spirit am I lacking in my life? What gift have you given me that can serve the body of Christ, that can build the church for the glory of God? We've got to be men and women committed to prayer. That's got to be the first thing we do. And I know many of you have set goals for the new year. We've talked about this. I talked about it last week a little bit when we talked about making a gospel resolution, that we're going to grow in the gospel this year. Luke read from the book that we're going through, the gospel, how the church portrays the beauty of Christ by Ray Orland, how we're going to read that book in the first quarter of 2024. I want you reading it because what we're trying to do is not only gain a greater understanding of the gospel, but that what happens is, is that when we, when we get this understanding of our growing knowledge of the gospel, what it's going to do, it's going to create a culture in us to where then we're going to live and love the way that Jesus did. That's the goal. The goal is understanding the gospel doctrine so it creates a gospel culture in us so that gospel culture brings and is birthed a place where people can come who are hurting, who are broken who are shattered, and they can come to the church of Jesus Christ and say, I have hope now. I'm amongst people who aren't perfect. I'm amongst people who were once broken, who were once shattered. I'm amongst people who were once addicted. I'm now amongst people who were sinners, just as me, and some even greater than me. And therefore, what I have found is I found a church that is real, a church that is authentic, a church that is not an audience, but a church that is an army that's doing something for the kingdom of God. Amen? That's the people that we want to be. This is why we want to dive in to the gospel. But for us to get there, I just don't want to dive in right here at the beginning. I want us to bathe this thing in prayer for each of you to be asking God, what area, Lord, do I need to grow in? In my own life, first and foremost, not only can I grow in the gospel, but Lord, what fruit of the Spirit needs to be evident in my life more and more? Is it love? Is it joy? Is it peace? Is it patience? Is it gentleness? Is it faithfulness? Is it self-control? Lord, what of these fruits of the Spirit are you wanting to do in me? But let's be like Nehemiah. Let's begin in prayer. Let's be committed to prayer. Let's be praying these things. Keep this thing before you and say, Lord, build, do something in me. Build in me first, Lord. Build in me first so that I can become someone who is authentic. Someone that sees me as being real and not just this facade of Christianity. It just breaks my heart of what people said. I was reading an article yesterday. I don't know, maybe if some of you read it. But I was reading it yesterday, and, and this woman, this, whoever she was, I forgot her name now, but she's this well-known author, and she was responding off of a tweet of someone else, and she says, well, the Bible is nothing more than fiction. Well, obviously that caused a big stir on everything. But then I read her quote and then I, and I'm like, dear God, I, I agree with her on not the, the, the Bible is fiction, but what she was saying because of what the, the guy was saying pertaining to, it was just religion. And she's just saying, well, this, see, this is just religion. And that's why the Bible is nothing more than fiction. There's, no, there's nothing more than hypocrisy. And, and, and I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, well, obviously the Bible isn't fiction. It is the word of God. But what she's responding to on this guy's quote, I just sat back and just thought, I was reading it to Kay last night in bed. I just said, honey, the sad thing is, I would agree with her assessment of this guy's tweet. Because Christianity can come across so fake. Well, let me, I take that back. Not Christianity. Religion can come across as fake. 
Christianity is about a relationship with Jesus Christ. I want men and women, I want to build an army that's authentic, that to where we understand our weaknesses. I'm not saying we're perfect and we need to be self-righteous in every way, but what I'm saying is, is that what we need to be is understand that you and I are nothing more than redeemed sinners. It's the grace of God is why we're here. You know, I, that's why I love so much when I think of evangelism or being bold. When I, when I think of it, I love the, the, when you talk about Charles Spurgeon and how he talks about evangelism. Charles Spurgeon said, evangelism is nothing more than one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. And that's exactly right. That's who we are. We're nothing more. There's nothing is any different than me than someone who is out in the world living crazy, doing that, other than the grace and mercy of God. That's it. Apart from the grace and mercy of God, I would be doing the same thing what they're doing. But God has redeemed me. God has saved me. He's made me his own, and I want to know him, and I want to be real, and I want to be authentic. I'm not perfect and that's the amazing thing about it. And thank you for all of you not saying amen when I said I'm not perfect, especially my wife. But guys, we've got to be authentic. We've got to be real. And I believe that we're, that starts with prayer, that we're not only just men and women committed to prayer, but that we are men and women persistent in prayer. Let's not give up. Let's not just pray a couple of hours and then end it. But let's go and let's see what God can do. And look at the quote in your notes, or I believe it's on the screen. Yep. By Emmy Bounds, he says this, God shapes the world by prayer. The prayers of God's saints are the capital stock of heaven by which God carries on his great work upon the earth. That's what Nehemiah is finding out. He is praying. He understands that God shapes the world through prayer. But Nehemiah also understands this. He understands Proverbs 21.1, which says that the king's heart is in the Lord's hand, and he directs it as he wills. Nehemiah is very aware of it. He's read, I'm sure, the Proverbs of Solomon. But he understands that the king is nothing but a mere man, that he serves, but he serves a greater king, the one who is above all things, the one who that king has this human king's heart in his hands. And that's why he can go to prayer. And he can know that my prayer, and I'm praying to a God who can use my prayer to change the world. And not only use my prayers, but this king, as I pray, this God can also use me to change and bring about change. And so we see that Nehemiah's prayer, that he is a man of prayer. And then I want to look at Nehemiah's confession. So during this time of prayer, there is a, a time of confession of sin. That's what he says in, looked at in verse 6. At the end of verse 6, he says, Confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which we have sinned against you, even I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you. And so Nehemiah's confession before God as he's coming to him in prayer, as he's coming in and he's just talking about, hey, Lord, this is, this is, this is us. Lord, I, I pray that you listen to, that you open up your ears, open up your heart to your servant's prayers. But Lord, now I, I know what you're dealing with. You're dealing with people who have sinned. You're dealing with people that you sent into exile because of their sins. And Lord, it's not, and, and I love how Nehemiah comes in here and he doesn't exclude himself from this confession of sin, does he? He includes himself in it. He doesn't say, yeah, Lord, all those people that many years ago, 70 years ago, forsook you and worshiped other idols and you sent them into captivity, Lord, we got what we deserve. No, no, Nehemiah includes himself in this confession of sin. Lord, it, it, this, the people of Israel, we did this, but not only the people of Israel, but even I and my father's house have sinned. You know, I, I love that. 
You know, many times when we pray and you talk about prayer, you, different people talk about different types of praying, you know, different things. And it says, follow the book of Acts or follow the word Acts. Adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication. So you, you worship God, you thank God for who he is, all that fun. And then you confess. You bring confession. Confession is a wonderful way to, to come in and say, Lord, I know. Many times I'm praying, I say, Lord, <laughs> I, I, I worship you. You're a great God, but Lord, I know that I, I am a sinner. I know that my heart at different times is prone to wander. Lord, I know what I'm dealing with here. And we begin to confess to the Lord our sin in the process before then we give thanksgiving and bring supplication to the Lord. So Nehemiah begins this. He doesn't separate himself from the people of God. He includes himself there. Nehemiah could have been bitter because of the people of Israel's sin that led them into captivity, but he's not. But here's a guy, like I said, that was probably born in captivity, a guy who's probably never been to Jerusalem. But Nehemiah is well aware of his past. He's well aware of his present. But now he's, he's praying about the future and what God has for him here. But then Nehemiah then concludes with, we have a Nehemiah's prayer, we have Nehemiah's confession, but now we have Nehemiah's confidence. And Nehemiah's confidence is in God and his word and God's promises. I am sure Nehemiah is aware of Jer uh, Jeremiah's prophetic word of 70 years of captivity. I mean, how could you not be, right? It's come to pass. I'm sure his father and his grandfather would have told him, oh man, we're living Jeremiah's prophetic word. 70 years of exile. And now there's a spark of hope because of what uh, Cyrus the Great did in sending the people back to Jerusalem to begin to rebuild the temple. But in the midst of rebuilding the temple, the walls and the gates are burned and, and the city is still vulnerable and they're not safe and not protected. And so this is what's driving Nehemiah at this point as he begins. But then Nehemiah ends his prayer with a confidence in God, a confidence in God's word and God's character. If you remember what my focus point was today, it was simply the fact that uh, we, uh, during times of difficulty, we are to turn to prayer and to the character of God. And that is what Nehemiah is doing in verses 10 and 11. I don't want to look at that together with us. Because, again, as I mentioned earlier, Nehemiah knew that there was nothing he could do in the natural. He wasn't going to be able to change the king's heart. But Nehemiah knew his confidence was in God. And Nehemiah knew that this king was nothing more than a man in God's hands. And so Nehemiah, as I mentioned earlier, Nehemiah, as he looks at verse 10, as we look at verse 10, but you would have known Proverbs 21, 1, where I told you the king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he will. But look at what he says and prays in verses 10 and 11. He says, they are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed. You see, that's the beauty. That's, that's really for us, the gospel of Jesus Christ coming in for us. When we pray, we can even say this, Lord, thank you that these people are your people. Thank you that I am part of your people, that you have redeemed me. And God has, re not only is Nehemiah praying for the people of Jerusalem and the people of Israel and the servants that they are and telling them that, God, these are the people whom you redeemed. When did he redeem them? He redeemed them when he took them out of Egypt. And he brought them to the promised land. And he made them a great nation. I mean, think of it. I mean, at the height of Solomon's reign, you had the queen of Sheba come to Jerusalem and see all that God did. And she walked away knowing that God was a mighty God. And then after the reign and Solomon dies, the divided kingdom is split in two. And then it goes downhill from there. 
And then the people forsake the Lord and begin to go their own way and worship other idols and all the pagan rituals. And God said, I've had enough. Now you're going into exile. But this is what God did. Nehemiah is reminding God of his character. What God did. Lord, this is what you did. You, Lord, you redeemed the people. You're the one that redeemed them. They didn't redeem themselves. Lord, when they were in exile and in slavery in Egypt, you came and you brought Moses. And you brought Moses, the great deliverer, to lead the people out of the bondage of slavery and bring them into freedom. You redeemed them, Lord, not Moses. You used Moses to redeem the people, but you are the one who redeems. You are the great redeemer. You redeemed them by your great power and by your strong hand. That's how God did it. And you know what's amazing for you and me and why we can say this? When we pray, we stand on the character of God because I can actually say, God, you redeemed me. I was running to hell as fast as I could. And by your mercy and grace, you saved me. I didn't choose you. You chose me. You chose me first, and I responded to that call. It's just as simple as that. Because I was dead in trespasses and sins, the Bible says. And when you're dead, man, you are dead. And this is what we see and experience. But this is what he does. And then he says, In verse 11, O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayers of your servant who delight to fear your name and give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. Nehemiah knows what he's getting ready to do. He's getting ready to approach the king and ask him to send him to Jerusalem to fix the walls and the gates. And Nehemiah is dependent on God. I'm going to ask him, Lord, I'm going to go and I'm going to ask the king, so Lord, you've redeemed your people by your great hand and what you've done, and now Lord, give me success. Give me success as I go and talk to this man. That's all he is is a man. Nehemiah is praying to a great God who has the king's heart in his hands. And that's what it is. Whatever it is that you're going through, Whatever it is that you're facing, whatever difficulties when we get there, man, look at this and see this. But we've got to be men and women of prayer. And as the worship team comes forward, I want to close with these two quotes in your notes or on the screen. I love this quote by Emmy Bounds. He says this, the church is looking for better methods, but God is looking for better men. What the church needs today is not more machinery or new organizations or novel methods, but men whom the Holy Spirit can use, men of prayer, men mighty in prayer. The Holy Spirit does not flow through methods, but through men. He anoints not plans, but men, men of prayer. Amen? We've got to be men and women of prayer. This is what Emmy Bounds is saying. I love Emmy Bounds. read a lot of his books on prayer. And then the last quote, as you stand to your feet. As we read this last quote, he says this. Like many since his time, Nehemiah's greatness came from asking great things of a great God and attempting great things in reliance on him. That's what we're doing in 2024. We're asking God for great things and we're asking this great God for great things because we're going to attempt great things for him and our attempting of it is going to be our reliance on him just as much as Nehemiah is relying on God when he goes to the king so you and I are going to be relying on God as we go and build as we build ourselves, as we build our marriages, as we build our families, as we build our church, we need God and the reliance on Him. That's what God wants to do. So let's pray. Father, I thank you for today. And Lord, I know there's a lot of information that was given. But Lord, what comes through more than anything, Lord, is our need for you. God, we got to turn to you in prayer. And we got to trust in your character. 
And that's where our confidence is, Lord. Our confidence is in you. You can change us. You can mold us. You can shape us into the men and women of God that you've called us to be. So I thank you for it. I praise you for it. Amen. Let's worship together.